Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. Ah. Today on the Online Great Books <laughs> Podcast... Listen, everything's harder right now. I thought the sigh was because this is a book that you really loved and you didn't want me to crap on it. I do love this book, and um, I feel very vulnerable right now as a result. But everything's really harder than it ought to be right now. Yes, I tried to buy a freezer this morning because our freezer quit and ruined all of our freezer food. Ugh. I can't find one. I di- I finally did, but I'm, it's going to take two weeks to get, and I'm going to have to go get it. Mm-hmm. Because of the current events in 2020, there is a shortage of freezers in the United States of America, if you didn't know that. Will the new freezer fit in the Odyssey? Uh, It will if I take the seats out, which I know how to do. There you go, man of resources. Yeah, it'll fit. Uh, Today we're going to read Wendell Berry's book, Jaber Crow, J-A-Y-B-E-R, copyright 2000. Brett McKay gave me this book for my birthday. He said, here's a book for you. And I said, well, thanks for giving me this. He's like, no, you don't understand. He wrote this book for you. <laughs> it's, it's been sitting on my shelf. It's uh, July 2nd right now, and it's been sitting on my shelf since October when he gave me this for my birthday. And I just shoehorned it in the list because I wanted to get to it. And I had no idea what I was getting into. But in the first 28 pages, I laughed out loud a couple times and cried too. Uh, I think he's right. I think Wendell Berry wrote this for me. It, everything's about me. Like anytime anybody writes something, they either do it in reaction to me or because they wanted me to have it. I don't know if you knew that. Your theory conflicts with my theory. Oh, it does. (laughs) What's your theory? That everything's about me. Oh, I see. So I'm not sure how this can work out. I don't either. I love the book. And so, so I called Carl and I said, well, I sure would like to do this one. And uh, I love it very much. And I was telling you before that we turned the microphones on that I liked it so much that everyone I've recommended it to has scared me a little bit (laughs) because if they don't love it, I don't know what's going to happen between the two of us. (laughs) And it's like handing somebody a Robin's egg, you know, you don't want them to drop it or harm it. You just want them to love it too. You know? Yeah. That's how I feel about this book. I thought it was beautiful. It's a wonderful book. It's designed to tug at the places in you that need to be tugged. Yeah. I think. And maybe some of you out there need some tugging too. (laughs) That sounds kind of weird. But it's a story about a a man uh, who lives through most of the 20th century and spends it, most of it, in a small town in Kentucky by choice. A man of talent and intelligence who decides to become, or is called to become, a barber. And he's just a town barber. And that's it. I guess it's a waste of a life. He didn't have a high-powered career. He didn't go... Well, he, he... he went to college for a year. Yeah. And then said it wasn't for him, figured out it wasn't for him and walked out. Well, before you even get into the book, Mr. Barry, uh, who's in his late 80s at this point, Wendell Berry has written most of his adult life, received a great deal of acclaim, ended up teaching here and there and getting married and living in Paris for a time. And then when he was 41 years old, he threw all that over his shoulder, his sort of cosmopolitan modern life and bought 125 acres in Kentucky and decided to farm. And he continues to do that. He's in his late eighties and he still farms. And when in his brand of farming, he uses mule teams and no chemicals, keeps it simple. And he does it the old ways. And this book is really about people that live those sort of values that he still tries to live. And he writes at the beginning of the book, notice Persons attempting to find a text in this book will be prosecuted. Persons attempting to find a subtext in it will be banished. Persons attempting to explain, interpret, explicate, analyze, deconstruct, or otherwise understand it will be exiled to a desert island in the company only of other explainers by order of the author. That's a little page out of Twain, isn't it? Well, I guess that's the podcast. (laughs) I know. Right? That's all we can do. We can't do anything about it. Well, I don't know. I think we can enjoy it and we can say uh, what it did to us or for us. I was going to try to explain and interpret a little bit, well, I think but now okay. I'm not. I can't. <laughs> we won't tell him. I think Twain put a little disclaimer like this in one of his books. I can't remember which one. 
Huckleberry Finn. Okay, it, the yeah. good one. That's the good Twain book. I haven't read that since I was about thirteen. I'd like to get back to that one one day. It's it's real good. It's uh, trouble these days because of the language and right, sort right. of predilections that we have. It is a profound anti-slavery book, in my opinion. But yeah, I, I don't um, know how there's any other reading of it. Maybe we'll just do that show one day. Uh, this book, by the way, I think is a cross between maybe The Fountainhead and Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say The Fountainhead? Uh, the Fountainhead is a thinly veiled description of Ayn Rand's worldview and what she thinks a good man should be or how she thinks good good man should act in Rourke. I think Rourke is her better, biggest hero above Dagny Tagner, Taggart or any of the Alice Shrugged heroes. I don't know if somebody will fight with me about it, but, but I think that's what that's about. And she has a different worldview about what the right way to live is and what, what, what the best kind of achievement for a man would be and so on. But I think Barry has his own ideas about that. And, and he uses this to put those ideas, this fiction here to put those ideas forth, I think. I think that's an interesting comparison because at one point, it's been a while since I read it, Rourke, I think, he was building uh, some kind of housing complex and he was fed up with it and he, did he blow it up or something? Burned it, something. He blew up at one of his own buildings, but he did something to a housing. He got rid of his own work and, and rejected his own work or what everyone else wanted him to do. And there's a scene like that in uh, this book. So Jaber is his name, it's Jonah Crow. Except everybody, when he finally gets back to uh, the town at Port William, everybody calls him Jaber. Which is short for Jaybird. Yeah. But we don't have time to say Jaybird. Jaber. Well, and he's got a double bird name. Yeah. Did you notice that? Yeah. Jaybird Crow. And his name is Jonah. And you noticed there was a flood. I know Jonah wasn't quite in a flood, but Jonah went underwater. So this is what a cool author will do, okay? So he could have said... He could have said, here's my character named Jonah, and I'm going to have him like be stuck in a cave or something, and, and that'll be the whale, and it'll all match up in the whale story. No, no, it's just echoes of biblical stuff and lonely birds. So you do have Jonah passing through water. You have Jaber passing through water before he makes his decision to go back home. Well, that's interesting, but it's not a whale. And it's not just water. It's the great deluge of 1937. And so there's all kinds of echoes. If you wanted to do what he tells you not to do on the front page, you could do it. And you could say, well, that's kind of a baptism or it's kind of Jonah getting stuck in the belly of the whale, except there's no whale. It's certainly something. It's supposed to resonate. So what a, what a clever author will do, there's misdirection. Walker Percy talks about this. He's not going to hit you over the head with a direct allegory, you know, step by step. Uh, Tolkien says, too, you know, Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. If it was an allegory, the Allies would have grabbed the ring and used it. Hmm. So says Tolkien, but it just has echoes. It's a story told in a hall, a big hall with, with good sound. And so it has echoes of all the other stories that have been told before. It's pretty cool. It feels like a story with depth Ugh. when you read it. It does for me. So I said the, the Fountainhead thing and also said uh, Huckleberry Finn. Because this has a distinct regional flair, a flavor to it, like Huckleberry Finn. Like this is a book of its place, of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Jaber was born to some young people, like people were in 1918. Was his birthday? I think when he was four years old, both of his parents passed away. His his dad was a blacksmith in the in Squires Landing, and his mother was, a, of course, a mom. They both died, and. He remembers, and he tells a story about going to the funeral and a lady in the community, Aunt Cordy, everybody in the community are aunts and uncles. You're not related, you see, but they're kind old folks that care about the kids around, so everybody calls them aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. So anybody that's a generation older, you is your aunt or your uncle. And there was an Aunt Cordy and Uncle Othie uh, at the funeral. Aunt, aunt Cordy says, we're taking him home. And they cared for this young man until he was 10 uh, when they both died. And then he went to the orphanage. Woo. That's rough. Yeah. Well, that's the sort of thing that happened. Yeah. 
you can dig in your family tree and find cases like that for sure. So he's in that Port William area. Apparently, there's a whole bunch of stories about Port William. Apparently, Wendell Berry has done a bunch of novels on this. Everyone yeah. that saw me quote this thing on Instagram said, you're going to read the rest of them? Yes. Yeah, I'll put them in my infinite pile. <laughs> and he calls the people of Port William the Port William membership, which I like. And it, it's a community. It's a well-imagined, envisioned community in a way that uh, my community here, I really don't know my neighbors. I know one neighbor. Well, I know both of them on either side. I know one of them better than the other. The other one, I just know her to say hi to her. And then the rest of the street, I don't know who they are. I mean, my friends are internet friends, mostly. Mm -hmm. If we didn't come home for a month or two, who would notice in the neighborhood? Yeah. But in a small town like this, at least as Barry envisions it, everybody notices everything. He says, uh, you don't have your own business. Right? Mind your own business. Nobody in this town has his or her own business. It's all everybody's business. It's an extended family group, even though they aren't blood kin, although a lot of them are. Uh, I think the writing's beautiful. He's plucking all the right strings for me, uh, anyway. Here's a little chunk from the funeral. Jaber says, I remember crouching beside the wood box behind the kitchen stove while several people offered to pick me up and comfort me, and I would not look up. And then an old woman I knew as Aunt Cordy gathered me up without asking and sat down in the rocking chair and held me and let me cry. She had on a, a coarse black sweater over a black dress that reached her shoe tops and a black hat with little white and blue flowers on it there in the dead of winter. I can remember how she seemed to be trying to enclose me entirely in her arms. God love his heart, she said. Othi, we're going to take him home. Yep. Simple, tasteful. It kind of leaves you to have all the feelings mm. as the reader. Which is what he does a lot. Yeah, I can't um, read it. <laughs> Page 28. Finally, they both pass away. Uh, there's just, there's so many things here that I have underlined that, that just hit you. So he lived with them for a while. And Uncle Othi, did he have a shop? Yeah, he had the little general store down at the landing by the river. This is pre-highway. That's how people got their goods in and out of their little community. So he owned the he owned the little store at Squire's Landing. Yeah. So he lived with Uncle Othi and Aunt Cordy. They found Uncle Othi lying in the mud down on the river bank where he'd gone to bail out his boat after a hard rain. Uh, they took him up to the bed, um, and he died a little while after dark. But I knew a guy when I was working for my dad as a land surveyor, the head of the land surveying department, the head of the field crews. He got up, I think he got up in the middle of the night to go fix something in the house because it needed to be fixed. He didn't finish the job. You know, he died while he was doing it. To me, it's, it's an attractive way to go. You bet. I was out fixing the fences and then I died. You know, that <laughs> you, you don't stop and then spend five years dying. Yeah, and it's better than dying in your sleep too, right? Oh, he went to sleep. He went to bed, and he just never woke up. Now, how about if you're like, you know, have your agency and you're effective, and you're fixing the fence or you're bailing the boat out, and you fall over, dead. See, yep. You hear that lightning? Or no, you yep. don't hear lightning. You hear that thunder? See, somebody agrees with me. <laughs> we have we have dramatic sound effects here. Mm. Uh, I really liked the interchange. So, Cordy's starting to fade too. Yeah, she's pretty old. This is on page twenty-seven. I like her reaction to the sadness of life. It's humor in the midst of it. So one day, standing at the kitchen door, she called loudly, loudly, "Oh, Othi, oh, Othi!" I said, "Aunt Cordy, Uncle Othi ain't here," and she said just as nicely as if I had put her mind at rest. Well, I reckon that's why he don't answer. Yeah. <laughs> She'd forgotten he was dead. And then when she's reminded, she just laughs about it. Our friend John has pointed out that nowadays we tend to think that death is the worst thing possible and all of our actions are designed to either avoid it or to put it safely in buildings where it doesn't affect us. Yeah. Our earlier generations, it was all over the place. It's not a great thing. You know, you don't want 20 million people dying of the flu. 
but it might make you have a healthier understanding of it, that it is the natural course of everyone's life. Yep. I'm going to tell this story and it's going to be wrong, but this is the way I remember it. My great aunt Vera had, I believe it was liver cancer. This would have been in the early eighties and I would have been maybe uh, 10 years old and uh, she wasn't going to make it. And the way I remember it, I know that she was not in the hospital and she was at my great grandmother's house, which was her mother. And if I remember it right, she died on her couch, on her mom's couch. Hmm. It's pretty good. I was digging on Ancestry.com. I was chasing down some, because of the current situation, I can go on it for free with my library card. I found I have a French ancestor. I'm oh, not sure how no. I feel about that. Sorry for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh well she was from canada and then she was from alsace in france but her last name was dietrich so i think she was german but i remember i was a little disappointed i was looking up my grandfather who i always remember being in his house his house is still there as far as i know and i just remember him so his wife died in 1980 he died in 1990 he was 88 years old he spent all the time i ever, that i ever knew him just reading couldn't hear very well. Some people could say the same of you. <laughs> what is that expression that doesn't fall far from the tree? The fruit? Yeah. <laughs> well, I collected a bunch of his books. But I was disappointed when I, I looked on Ancestry.com and it said, place of death, Chicago Heights. He didn't live in Chicago Heights. Hmm. Ah, that's where he died. Right. Right, because they took him to St. James Hospital and... That's the course of death away from friends and family in an institution. And the great grandmother who outlived her daughter Vera died on my uncle Joe's in my uncle Joe's house. She was born in Indian territory, lived to be just almost 90 years old and died in her son's home uh, that shared a fence with her house. It's pretty good. Being a little kid, being around these people that are like when you're a little kid and somebody's on death's door, it's scary. They look dead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Not a lot of fun to be around, but it's still a good way to go about it, I think. I, I hope that for myself. Well, it, the book is not this morbid. The book is hilarious. It, it is. Okay, just so you know, the book is very, very funny, but we're, we're focusing on the deaths that he had in his life. I want to go back to one of the funny things. There's so many. What is it? It's on page five and six. Grover Gibbs... Was passing along in front of Mr. Settle's garage with a plumber's helper over his shoulder. He saw sticking out from beneath an automobile Portly Jones's sweat shiny big bald head, to the top of which, with a smooth and forceful underhanded thrust, he affixed the suction cup. So he just saw this guy's bald head and he <laughs> sticks a plunger on top of his head and he can't get it off. Uh <laughs> And the guy who did it's just walking with his hands innocently folded behind the bib of his overalls, a disinterested look in his eyes, his face rather tensely drawn around a small hole between his lips, through which he was whistling a tune. He allowed himself to be confronted by Portly, looking perhaps like a unicorn with a red face. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Grover, who done this? If it was you, I'll kill you. Grover said nothing, but solemnly still whistling, tried to help Portly remove his horn, which they were able to do only by boring a hole in the cup to re relieve the suction. It completely ruined my plunger, Grover told me later. But of course, I couldn't have claimed it anyway. <laughs> so good. He says that Portly Jones drug himself out from underneath the car by the handle, essentially. <laughs> so silly. But that's the kind of stuff that happens, and those are the stories that people remember for 50 years in a small town. Uncle Othi and Aunt Cordy died. And he had another funeral, another set of funerals. And he says, uh, but after she died, there was no Aunt Cordy to come to my rescue this time. I'd used up my allotted supply of Aunt Cordy's. There had been one when I needed her most, and that was all. I don't mean to say that one was not enough. One was enough and more, but only there was no second. And so I went out of the hands of love into the hands of charity as we know it, which included love only as it might. That's the kind of phrase this guy writes down. It's just wonderful, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The the writing is, is um, tasty. Yeah. Gosh, he's a good writer. I read this book in three days. Yeah. With all the other stuff I have going on, I I, I galloped through it in three big chunks. Uh, I like on page 28... 
the way he describes lives. I was a little past 10 years old and I was the survivor already of two stories completely ended. So all of these people that you knew or that you might have known, they have stories. And the stories have a beginning and they have an end. And the problem with stories, and I think part of what the character Jaber is doing, it's 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 in the first person. It's as if he's writing it, even though he's fictional. It's the duty of memory. Hmm. Because nobody's going to remember Othi and Cordy. Yeah. Unless he does. That's a depressing thing when you do poke into your ancestry and you find it. I don't know this person. I don't know what he was like. Yeah. Uncle Othi and Aunt Cordy never had any kids. So they don't have a legacy but Jaber, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't build any big monument or any mansion or uh, business that lived past them or write the great American novel. And, uh, well, so he's it. Yeah. The, and the other day I was out at my dad's shop and my uncle Roy drove up. That's my mom's youngest brother. And we sat down and started shooting the shit. And I said something about his uncle JP. Uncle JP was World War II age, and he did not go to World War II. I've talked, uh, did not go into the military. I think I've talked about him on this podcast. They hid him. They changed the birth dates in the family Bible and everything to keep those boys from getting getting drafted because they had crops to get in, didn't care about France, you know. We, we were talking about them, and my uncle Roy said, "Well, you know why they never had kids, don't you?" I said, "No." He said, "Well, JP was little. He got the mumps, and they went down on him." The mumps went down on him. <laughs> so, so I guess he had a real high fever and they attributed his sterility to the fact that, <laughs> that the mumps went down. Interesting expression. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, me and my uncle Roy and just a few other people are the only ones that know anything about JP and Edith and that, you know, and <laughs> any of those stories. The, the story lives on as long as somebody remembers it. And, and that's why I just said it. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking now, because I've been thinking about my dad's parents quite a bit recently. My grandmother, Pauline, we, they called her Peg, I called her Grandma. So I was nine when she died, and mostly I remember the cigarette smoke. Yeah. Just watching it curl up, seeing it go from laminar to turbulent flow. I know what that means now, but when I was a kid, I thought it was very neat because it's smooth yep. coming off the cigarette. And I love the smell because it was her house. So cigarettes still make me think of her. But I was remembering a few times we would go to the Marshall Fields in Park Forest, Illinois. I don't think it's there anymore. I think Marshall Fields has gone away. It was a big department store here in Illinois. And they had a restaurant and we would go sit up there. And I remember we would get... uh it, it would be lunch with my mom because they didn't always get along. Hmm. And, and my grandma thought that she was, she was lace curtain Irish. She was not shanty Irish. That was the way she put it. I think she might've been shanty Irish though, but she, <laughs> she, she says she's lace curtain. So you go have this very proper lunch and we would get Coca-Cola, the full sugar kind in a glass bottle with a paper straw. Yeah. And I remember that that was a big deal. You know, that that's going to go away. Who's going to know anything about Pauline shoot, you know, after we go, it's a little melancholy, you know, yep. somewhere in this book, he does something with history where how many memories do you have to go back to get to historical events? Hilaire Belloc does the same thing. My grandfather's born in eight, no, 1902, 1902. I think his grandfather was born in 1835 hmm. probably one more grandfather were were past the revolution although they would have been in germany at the time you know that's living memory that you can go back pretty far if you know somebody who's older who remembered something or knew somebody who remembered something you can get back a few centuries in like three or four people yeah you're not very far from these events not really. It makes them much closer to you. Yeah. Which is doing kind of what this book is doing is giving you a sense of time, of memory, of the places that people play in it. 
uh, I would say you get a, a sense of connection with the whole Port William membership. Yeah. Viewed as a whole, like it's one thing. Appalachia. I don't know if we're ever going to get through this thing. I'm certainly not going to get through it without crying. Well, we can go faster. Yeah, that's fine. Let's go slow. It's yummy. The book's slow. It's a quick read, but the book's slow. It's great. After the aunt and uncle died, he gets taken off to what we'd call a county home here, but they called it the Good Shepherd. It's the orphanage, and it's run by some sort of a religious organization that he never, he doesn't really name it. We're not supposed to explicate this. We're not supposed to do a deep dive, but here I go. <laughs> he shows up over there, and he says, Jaber. He says, I could not sort it all out until afterward, not not really, until after I had come back to Port William. I know now that order was thought to emanate from the institution and disorder from nature. Order was of the soul, whose claims the institution represented. Disorder was of the body, which was us. That's the whole philosophy behind the uh, what looked to me like Calvinist influence and authoritarian organization at the orphanage that was represented by Brother White Spade. By the way, we've already been to two, at least two funerals in this book, maybe four. Brother White Spade takes care of them at the orphanage, and ultimately, Jaber is the grave digger for Port Williams. Yes, barber and grave digger. Yeah. And cleans the church, too. Well, you've got a good community if you have one of those guys in it. You know, I'm from a little shitty town. And it's shitty because I came in after after the decline that happened to small town America. And this book is a lot about that. He talks about how after World War II, things were never the, ch- never the same, uh, whether it's due to highways or mechanization or just a philosophical change in the country. Port Williams undergoes a decline. And I was from a little town that uh, had seen its better days and everything that happens in this book between 1918 and 19, uh, about 1980 in Port Williams happened to my little town, Catoosa, Oklahoma, which is now no place that really anybody wants to be. All those towns had a guy like this. You know, Jaber never gets married. And he's kind of weird. He really is. Well, he does get married. Well, he does get married. Well, get But married. it's a very odd marriage. He never has a, a spouse there with him. He never has any kids. He's a weird dude. And everybody kind of had, all these towns had a kind of a weird guy that maybe he was the dog catcher and uh, he had a tractor and he'd plow gardens in the spring for people. And he lived in a little house with no running water and he kind of wanted to stay away from there, but he was an okay guy. And Jaber's that kind of weird dude. Some of these guys, (laughs) somebody's going to write me an email about this. Some (laughs) of these guys literally got kicked by a mule or something and just weren't that bright. Uh, had trouble. Some of them got smallpox and just, you know, weren't as smart as they could have been. You know, so a lot of them struggled and had trouble, but the community found things they could do that were useful. There was a guy around the, my hometown named Lenny that was that. And there were other ones. And he's kind of that guy, but he's not touched in the head, as we'd say. He wasn't mule kicked. He was a re- he's very intelligent, but because of all the traumas he went through, he peeps always on the outside, even though he was in the middle of that town and he recognizes that. Mm -hmm. The nearest thing I have to this is the church where I go. And we've got some guys like that. Uh, I've got some ladies like that too. The ladies who will make sure that the food's made Mm. or wrangle the kids. We're lucky to have kids at the parish. Not all churches have kids anymore. Half of them are mine, but... (laughs) Um, so we have this time in the middle of the church where you come out and you do the gospel and they need the podium moved out and there'll be these guys that can't hardly walk, but they're going to go move that podium because it has to be done. Yep. They're not going to say a word about it. No one has to ask them. They're just paying attention and they see what needs to be done and they do it because it's a community, right? Compare it. If, if you're walking down the streets of a city you see a piece of trash on the ground. What are you going to do? If it ain't gum, I pick it up, probably. You might pick it up, but you'd be odd. Most people aren't going to do anything because it's not their city. <laughs> we go walking around, and I kept coming back in the house and take a bunch of trash out of my pockets. Kids are like, what are you doing? Now, I, I know you don't like that long, Larry series, but one of the things I liked about it, the sheriff 
he has a little rollover accident in the in I think the first episode, and there's a bunch of beer cans in his car, and mm-hmm. people are thinking he's been drinking. No, he walks around town and he picks up beer cans and throws them in his police car. Yeah. Just because it's his community, and he's going to take care of it, whether anybody's paying him to or not. This is like a love poem to that sort of life. Yeah. The whole book. Yeah, everything fits in Jaber's world until it starts to not fit. Gosh, there's just so much to talk about in here for me. He goes to the Good Shepherd and reads all the time. His favorite time and his favorite place is the Sunday afternoons in the library in a particular corner. And he read. He kept a notebook. And he started to understand a little about himself there. And he said, um, he says there on page 38, I belonged even defiantly to what I remembered and not to the place where I was. And he watched everything all the time. And he says he remembers a little girl, E. Lawler. I watched her all the time. When her class went out to play, she did not take part, but only stood back and watched the other girls. She always wore a dress that sagged and brown cotton stockings that were always wrinkled. She was waiting. I did not understand that she was waiting, but she was. And then one day, as her classmates were joining hands to play out some sort of game, one of the girls broke the circle. She held out her hand to the newcomer to beckon her in, and E. Lawler ran to the circle and joined hands with the others. I wrote E. Lawler in my tablet so that I would not forget her. Yeah. Well, what good does it do for him to remember her? He lives in his memories so much, and he just loves to observe people. I think it's a duty to remember. Yeah. If people are important, everybody says that. Everybody says that, but most of us don't think other people are that important. Well, take a moment, look at the person, see what he's like on his own, and remember him. That's a pretty good deed you've just done. And it might not bear fruit, but maybe the next time you see him, you remember what he said the last time. That shows some care. And after he dies, you still remember him. Can you do good things for the the dead? Well, I don't know. That's a disputed question. But I think one of the things you could do would be remember them. Yeah. And it ain't bad for you either. Right. There are a bunch of words in this book that my people use that I don't see written ever. There's one, Q-U-I-E-T-U-S. Do your people use that word? Quietus? Quietus? Well, the the correct way to say it is the quietus, and it means to stop something. You best put the quietus on that, or I'm going to whoop you. (laughs) No, we didn't use that up here. Not that Uh, I recall. Jim Furr, who's a seminar host at online great books. I sent him a copy of this book because his people are from Eastern Arkansas or Western Arkansas and sharecroppers and so on. And, and I thought this would be right up his alley. And he t- texted me. He said, they, they, he actually used the word quietus in this book. And I said, yes. And it's spelled uh, K W H Y or it's pronounced E A T U S. And he said, that, you know, the word too. I mean, that's the, how you, that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> and here's another one. I'll just read the little section here. It's on page 57, and you can pick out the word. He sees a guy. He leaves the orphanage, and and he's uh, headed over to Lexington, Kentucky, the big city. And he sees a guy from the old town, Sam Hanks. He says, all in a pang, I remembered seeing his truck in front of my father's shop with a set of new racks, which I suppose my father had made. He had stopped by the store at Squire's Landing a many times. A many a time. It was a touchiest moment. I felt like I was on top of a tall pole ready to fall off. I could have told him who I was and he would have known, and yet it was too much. I had been 10 years gone, and I had no thought of ever going back. To have identified myself to him would have been like raising the dead, and I, I didn't have the heart. Touchiest. <laughs> Never said touchiest in my life. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know that I've said it, but I know folks that do. I think that's a, a big moment. If we were going to map this onto a Jonah story, which Wendell would get mad at me. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Wendell. I'm going to do it just a little bit. Okay. So the Jonah the prophet was told to go preach v- judgment on Nineveh. It's the short book in the Bible. You can read it. It's three pages. He doesn't want to do it. And he turns tail and runs the other way. This is like that moment. And then finally he gets on the boat and the boat is in trouble and they throw him overboard and he gets in the whale and then he ends up going back to Nineveh. 
But this is a moment he could have gone home. He probably should have gone home. Could have said, hey, Sam, don't you remember me? Mm-hmm. But he doesn't want to do it. He is resisting going back down, which is a word he uses later, to descend back to where he came from. He was resisting that. He thinks he's going to find something better in Lexington. He doesn't want to do what he's called to do. I'm going to add a, a thing here, by the way. Jonah in Hebrew means dove, I think. So he's got a triple bird name. <laughs> triple bird. Yeah. Yeah, th- th- this this Sam Hanks is a hell of a man, by my estimate. He's got this truck, and he's got these racks on it. Jaber says, do you raise stock yourself? And Sam... He drew on his pipe a little. No, there's plenty of people to do that and borrow money and pay interest like is not for the privilege. And he said privilege in a way I remembered. See, he talks like people from his place. He, no, he said, I'm just the man that hauls it to where they can give it away. Not sell it, give it away. Carl. Mm-hmm. Then he says, me, I ain't aiming to know, owe anybody anything. I'm an independent man and take my hat off to nobody. Then later on he says... He's, the guy says, what are you, some kind of communist or something? And he says, I'm Sam Hanks and a grown man. <laughs> so Sam recognizes Jaber. And uh, he takes him to, you know, he's really kind of hitchhiking. And he takes him down the road a piece and he lets him off. And then Jaber puts his hand in his pocket and Sam had snuck a $5 bill in there. In 1934. How many, like, how much is that now? $100? Isn't it like 25 times inflation? Could be. Yeah. I mean, it's real money. So he finds this, this $5 bill. Well, Sam never tells him that he recognizes him. Nope. And the, the conclusion of that story is when he finally does go back home to Port William, I don't have the page number handy, but when he finally goes back to Port William, he feels bad about it. Jaber feels bad that he took the five bucks and yeah. didn't reveal it. And so he goes <laughs> to give it back. Don't you remember you were in Lexington, you gave me a ride to Lexington and then you put $5 in my pocket and and Sam says something like, I've never been to Lexington. Yep. He just refuses to acknowledge that he was even there because he doesn't want to embarrass Jaber into having lied. This haunts Jaber. He says, "I I put my hand into my jacket pocket and felt paper. It was a new $5 bill that never had been folded but once. And so the first money I made on my entrance into the great world was liar's wages. It just haunted him. He's no Odysseus. No. (laughs) He's ready to lie his way through the world. When he was at the school, he would cut hair. Well, there was a man that would come in, I think he said twice a week, and come to the basement and give haircuts to all the orphans. He would help that fellow. He'd sweep the floor fetch and carry whatever and and then he would he cut some hair so he learned a little learned barbering uh, at the school and there on page 65 he runs into a guy says you don't know a barber looking for a job do you and jaber just pipes right up yes sir i said me he quit work entirely then and came around in front of the chair and stood there with scissors in one hand and his comb in the other looking at me with his face all bristly and the white whiskers around his mouth stained with ambeer not Amber. Finally, he said in a low voice, huh. He was brisk about his work after that. He brushed off the loose hair, shaved around my ears, and whisked away the neck cloth. And then he says, suppose you just give me a haircut and let's see. It's a good job interview. And it's on. We'll tell some more stories so these people don't get forgot, Carl. Yep. I worked at a grocery store and was a grocery sacker for a while, and then I was a checker. And a lady came through my checkout line, and she bought a bunch of cleaning supplies and toilet paper and stuff. And she paid with a check that said data storage on it. I said, what's this? What do you all do? And she said, well, we sell computer paper and my husband and I run it. And I said, huh, interesting. And she told me a little bit about it. Her name was Evelyn Land. And uh, I wrote that at name of that business down and the address on a napkin and put the check in the till, endorsed it, and put it in the till. And then Monday I drove over there. And I said, y'all aren't hiring, are you? You know. And they hired me, and I was the delivery driver for them uh, for about 18 months. Delivered computer paper. Green bar tractor feed computer paper to oil and gas companies in Tulsa. Uh, Mr. Bob Land there hired me 
he became a mentor of mine. I started another business, ended up selling it and so on. I was going to buy another business and I called him to have a look at, at it with me, to look at the books and to help me figure out if that was a good idea or not. When I came in, he said, why don't we not look at that today? Why don't you just buy this? <laughs> and I bought it. He helped me do that in, a, in, in many ways. He helped me do that. And I knew all the clients and I knew that uh, he was incapable of lying and I knew that it would be okay. And uh, anyway, it did. Similar story. Mm hmm. We get chances, everybody. Yeah. Just tell a whole bunch of stories. I want to talk about the shade <laughs> thrown on the college. Mm. He goes to he goes to college uh, for a little while, Pigeonville College. He just goes to the library and reads, takes naps. He says on page seventy one about the college. Well, a couple of things on the previous page. The university was in some ways the opposite of the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd looked upon the outside world as a threat to its conventional wisdom. The university looked upon itself as a threat to the conventional wisdom of the world, of the outside world. According to it, it not only knew more than ordinary people, but was more advanced and had a better idea of the world of the future. I want to go to the bottom of that page. The university thought of itself as a place of freedom for thought and study and experimentation, and maybe it was in a way, but it was an island too, a floating or a flying island. It was preparing people from the world of the past for the world of the future, and what was missing was the world of the present, where everybody was living its small, short, surprising, miserable, wonderful, blessed, damaged, only life. I have an asterisk next yeah. to that one. Preparing people from the past for the world of the future. Well, what about the present? You know, progress. We've got to have progress. We have to advance. Well, maybe. But where are you at right now? You know, I, I've, I've, I believe I have said on this podcast, I'm not a huge fan of the four-year college experience away from family and community. I think it makes us rootless. I think it's designed to do so. And if it's not designed to do so, it, it sure does a good job. You pay and send your kid off to college at 18 and she comes back at, at 22 or 21 and is a completely different person and thinks that everything that you've done is stupid. It's either by design or it's a real common side effect. I think it probably has a, quite a bit to do with the Port Williamses of the world going away just creating dissatisfaction with the present. Yeah. At the end of the first semester at that school where they have no room for the present, he said, uh, I kept attending classes until the Christmas vacation began and I kept on working, but I could see that I'd come to another end. I had completely lost the feeling that I should make something of myself. Aunt Cordy's voice troubled my mind, but it told me I didn't look down on my humble origins and didn't yearn to rise above them took me a long time to see what was happening to me then. Then he says a little bit later, I began motion of the heart toward my origins. Far from rising above them, I was longing to sink into them until I would know the fundamental things. I think this is another one of those key lines that lays out the big themes in the book. He doesn't like the institutions that believe that the order comes from the institution, which is both um, the Good Shepherd and the university. And he thinks to know the fundamental things, you have to go deep into your community. That you can't know the fundamental things being uncoupled from them in, in uh, artificial institutions. And the community is not artificial for all you yeah, but guys out there listening. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the, the cliche of maybe it was an earlier generation of people going off to find themselves. Ugh, there's nothing to find. But where you would go to find yourself, you would go backpacking across Europe to find yourself. I know a guy that was in the Peace Corps in Africa. I tell some funny stories about that. They had a Volkswagen van. I don't know. He was somewhere in Southern. They drove it all the way back to England. <laughs> you know, it was probably an epic trip and you had to bribe somebody at every border. Right. But that you're going to go find yourself that way. You think about what you're doing. No matter where you go, there you are. Right? Yep. Well, who are you? You don't need to travel to do that. I read an article on the 
sorry, secondary literature. I read an article on Lord of the Rings a while back, and it made the point that people miss. Bilbo goes home. Frodo tries to go home. The whole point of the journey is to go home. You know, not to, to set up somewhere else, which doesn't necessarily mean you have to live in the same town your entire life, but if you don't deal with the fundamental things, it doesn't matter where you live. Yeah, it's a very evocative book. Should we talk about his love affair? I want to read another chunk. Go ahead. I just love the writing. I love the whole aesthetic. I like, you know, he's telling us not to go look for any philosophy in here, but I can't help it. I can't help but see it. Barry seems to be a complete person, and it just bubbles up through here. I, I, I love it. He says, I'm an early riser. I come wide awake right out of sleep and generally know the time within maybe five or ten minutes. He's sleeping in a hayloft. He says, when I stood up and made sure of my box and unrolled my raincoat, the place seemed unearthly quiet. Only two or three of the men had wakened and were sitting and smoking on the edges of their cots, farmers, I imagined, with no chores to do that morning. And they were worrying about their places and their animals. All the others were asleep, and I remember how small and still and tender they looked. If I could have done it, I would have liked to tiptoe around and just lay my hand on each one. Hmm. Actually, he wasn't in the hayloft. He wasn't in the hayloft. He was in the, uh, I think it's a county courthouse in the middle of a big flood. There were farmers and people coming from all around it and s- slept in the courthouse because uh, it was on the high ground. But he wants to lay his hand on every one of them because he just wants yeah. to be closer, he wants to touch them. Well, it's uh, it's also a gesture of benediction. Yeah. I have all of my little echoes written on 93 after he makes his way back and he he lands in Port William. It's going to end up being the barber. There's baptism and resurrection, new creation, prodigal son, Jonah and the whale. Why is he called Crow? I'm sorry, Mr. Barry. I want to know. Is it just a name? I don't know. How do crows act? He had to eat some a little bit with Sam <laughs> coming home. Yeah. He's walking home in the biggest flood of anyone's memory. He gets picked up by a guy who ends up being his lifelong friend. And Burley Coulter. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if they named him Burley because of his build. He didn't say, They didn't talk about that. Or if it's because of tobacco or what. But all the names are good in this book. Athy, Othy, Burley. Mm-hmm. Skinner. Skinner. Matt Feltner with one with one T. Well, Burley, as they're driving back into town, has already figured out Jaber's life for him. He's already figured it out. <laughs> and he takes him down to Matt Feltner's house, who's a banker. Yeah, well, let's read a little bit of this. So yeah. this is a uh, bottom of 91. Burley recognizes him finally. Oh, you're the one that lived up with Uncle... Uncle Othie and Aunt Cordy, you went away when you was just a little bit of a boy after Aunt Cordy died. Here I am back passing through again, trying to get to Port William. So they go on a little bit and he says, well, well, I remember you. I sure do. And what's your line of work, Mr. Crow? I'm a barber. He had a further thought then it amused him. Now I reckon you work in one of them big fancy shops in Louisville. I'm probably saying that wrong. Louisville. Right. I imagine. With fans in the ceiling and a shoe shine stand and a pretty woman that files fingernails. Not hardly. At present, I'm out of a job. Well, here's where it gets good. Well, now, ain't that a coincident? Or did you know they're fresh out of a barber at Port William? He's already got it planned out. He's like, well, we need a barber. And you're a barber. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The shop's for sale? Oh, I imagine it is. And so he takes him, What does he take him straight to the, the guy who owns it? Yep. By the way, he, you, you, you cut out a little chunk. I'm so, it, I, he says, they're fresh out of a barber at Port William. I heard him, and then all of a sudden I was afraid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why was he afraid? I don't know. Because this is the vocation calling him. Hmm. You know, yeah. that if I stay in this place, I'll become rooted in this place. It's just yawning open to grab him and keep him there. A lot of the times the things that we probably ought to do are scary simply because of that. This is probably the only time I'm ever going to quote Sartre. 
<laughs> Jean Paul, where he said somewhere the reason why walking by a high cliff's edge is scary is not because you're afraid you'll fall, it's because you're afraid you'll jump. Yeah. That there's momentous freedom opening up ahead of you. You could make this choice. And it would be a real choice to become the barber. And that, that's frightening. Easier to just be a tumbleweed blowing along than to put down roots. Bartley took him to Feltner's house, who's holding the deed to the barber shop because uh, Barbara Horsefield had, had left town. And Mr. Feltner, this is the dre- depression, held it as security and Feltner skipped out on his, on his note there. And again, more reluctance. He says, we sat down. Feltner then says, you're not married, Mr. Crow. You've got no family responsibilities. No, sir. He laughed a little and glanced at Burley. A single man might make it. But he was serious when he looked back at me. And you've got experience as a barber? Yes, sir. I told him my experience. He sat looking out the window, and I knew he was deciding whether or not to ask me why, if I had a job, I was now looking for one. And I sat there trying to think and failing, thinking only that whatever I would say was probably going to be a surprise to me. He decided not to ask. He looked back at me and he studied me up and down. We had come to the dare. He said, $300 will buy the shop and whatever's in it. We'll need a third of the money down, the shop for collateral. He went on to set out all the terms of the loan, fair enough, but very strict in what he would expect from me. When we'd finished, the room was quiet. You will appreciate the tenderness of my situation if I remind you that I'd managed to live for years without being known to anybody. And that day, two men who knew who and where I had come from had looked at me face on, as I had not been looked at since I was a child. And now, there I sat, with about $120 in bills in my shoe and in the lining of my jacket, and, as I remember, 35 cents in my pocket. I was not, as they now say, mentally prepared. My face turned red to the eyeballs. I could feel the heat radiating from it. Both men were watching me, waiting to hear if I wanted the shop on the proposed terms and to see if I could come up with the money. I'll take it, I said. I worked a tight little roll of bills tied with a string out through the hole in the lining of my jacket. And then I took off my overshoe and the shoe and got the rest. I laid a $50 bill in two 20s and a 10 on the table in front of Mr. Feltner. It was a funny moment. A time would come when even I would think so, but that day it was hard. I felt revealed as if to buy the shop I had to take off all my clothes. But Burley and Mr. Feltner never allowed the least twitch or touch of amusement to show in, even in their eyes. They sat there as if not a man in Port William had ever paid for anything without taking off his shoe. (laughs) I like the delicacy that the the gentleman characters in this have. Well, all of the characters, but it is probably, it's probably because you have to, to live with them where they're not going to embarrass him because they know him. Mm. You know, there's a scene early in the book where Jaber had to throw somebody out of the shop and the guy comes back eventually and apologizes. And, and do you think you could forgive a son of a bitch? It's like, yeah, yes, sir. I think I can. Yeah. Why does this thing tear me up so bad? I couldn't even read about him paying for a barbershop. Because it's a lost world that you miss or that you want to recreate. Yeah. So Mr. Felter gives him the keys and he goes straight down to the shop. And he says, anyhow... I spent that night in the barber chair wearing all the clothes I had and several sheets of newspaper, and by by daylight I was cold enough. When I bought data storage, I wanted to go down there and sleep there. (laughs) Yeah. Did you? Uh, Not that time. When the weather was bad, (laughs) some I did. Makes me want to have a barber chair. Oh, for sure. You know, uh, Phillips Petroleum was started here in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and you could go to Mr. Frank Phillips. Mr. Everybody around here, even though he's... (laughs) Mr. Phillips' house, you can go up there. And he was a barber in Kansas before he and his brother started Phillips Petroleum. And there's a barber chair in his bedroom, and he'd sit there and read newspapers. It's still there. You can go see. That makes sense. Yeah. I could use one. It'd be better than this chair. This is a good chair, but it's no barber chair. I like the comparisons between farming and barbering that happened in this book a few times. Yeah. Uh, just raising a crop of hair. You know, that's what barbers do is that <laughs> you're just waiting for it to grow. And will enough of it grow to support you and your family? <laughs> so that's why the the older barber had to go. Yeah, He had a family and there wasn't enough hair crop in Port William to support him. 
but for a bachelor, it might be good. Oh, I want to talk about the st- the scene at the grandstand. Okay. Page number. <laughs> oh, God. With the little it's water drinking party? Yeah, it's right at the beginning of part two. It starts at page 109. Now, these people fox hunt. And around where I was, we didn't fox hunt, but we did coon hunt. Same kind of concept. Now, in England, when they fox hunt, they do it on horseback, and you've seen it, and they wear their red jackets and all this crazy shit. But around here, you let the dogs loose, and you get on a high spot, and you listen for them, and they'll chase and tree a coon, and then you go to where the trees, the coons treed. Uh, and they typically just chase the fox, and you never get anything out of it. But you get to hear the, dog, the dogs work. The dogs have got their own voices. You know, like uh, we go, we go coon hunt with uh, Richard Replogle, and he had a bunch of coon hounds. He had red bones and blue ticks, right? Because that's what you have. And they all had names, of course. And, and he knew their voices. He said, that's a ranger. He'd, he'd tell you who it was and what they were doing. And then, you know, you'd go to where they were. And sure enough, ranger had a dog, had a coon treed, and none of the dog, others had caught up with him. And he knew their voices. Well, they go to the grandstand, which is a high place, and let the hounds out. And the hounds are hunting. And they're listening to the hounds. And uh, they'd caught a few fish, and they fried them up on an iron skillet on the fire. Burley says, he says, that fish will dry you out. See if this won't moisten your swallow. I took a taste. It was a local product, as innocent of water as the inmost coal of the fire, but also mellow and fragrant. Fragrant. And then I took three swallows, for the fish surely was drying me out. Did you hear what it said, Burley asked me? It said, good, good, good. That jug doesn't go glug, glug. It goes, good, good, good. He tilted the jug, the jug to his own lips, and it said, good, good. And it goes around, and finally, when Julep, which is a drink, right? When Julep Smallwood, who had been watching it as a cat watches a mouse, uh, lifted it, and it said, good, 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 good. That's a big drink. Mm-hmm. Is he <laughs> the one that only drank when it was other people's liquor? Yes. Yeah, the next page. If Julep had drunk only the liquor he paid for, he would have been dry as a preacher. He would have crackled when he walked. <laughs> Julep's addiction was to free liquor, namely other people's. Uh, <laughs> haven't you had a friend like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a friend. I almost named him. Uh, all he ever had was a $100 bill, and he never wanted to break it, you know? <laughs> can can you pay the tab? I, I don't want to break it. This was, you know, this was when $100 or something. Now everything's $100. But, you know, in 1991... Nobody would break it. Yeah, that's how it was. But they're all up there on the grandstand, which is a high place out in the out in the woods, and a bunch of guys, and uh, they're listening to the hounds work, and have a little dinner in the dead of night, and pass the jug, and it's just wonderful until Cecilia shows up. Yeah, Cecilia Overhold. <laughs> It's a great name for her character. You don't really get to know much of her except that she's the enemy. She's on an unhappy married woman. Well, all right, that's 117. And then I saw Cecilia Overhold coming up the path. She was wearing a sort of baggy hat tilted stylishly over her right ear, a nicely tailored broadcloth coat with a fur collar and stockings and high heels. And she was walking like the divine wrath itself. She was a beautiful woman still in those days, really something to look at, but I did not regard her with extreme pleasure that morning. I just shut my eyes and lay still. Why I didn't get up and run, I can't tell you any more than I can tell you why Roy and the others had not run. We were all involved, I think, in a form of self-induced mental retardation. (laughs) (laughs) Well, she comes up and breaks up the party. Uh, Oh, God. She says, come down from here, you Sunday card-playing sons of bitches. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, like, why is that an insult? Are you not allowed to play cards on Sunday? No. It's the Lord's Day. You can't play cards. I know some Assembly of God folks that won't play cards because their face is on them. And I don't know why that is, but that's what I was told. I didn't. They didn't go into it any farther than that. Well, it's a graven image. Yeah, but, you know, they got a picture of their wife and their billfold, too. And you well, know, I don't know. You know, what counts as graven and what doesn't? Right. You know the commandment is do not bow down before graven images. Well, what's yeah. the image? The king, the queen, the jack. 
What are you looking at, you bald-headed thing? She says. I hate to admit my vanity, but what she said hurt my feelings probably worse than anything else she could have done. What else she could have done and did do was pick up a smallish rock, all jaggedy and crusty with fossils, and throw it at me, hit me square in the mouth. After that, I played dead, which wasn't hard. (laughs) She broke his tooth. (laughs) She broke the liquor bottle. Yeah, that's not okay. She was unhappy. (laughs) But she's got to live there, too. Yep. And everybody's got to f- figure out a way of living. So he stumbles back to town. And he says, it was not a situation in which a bachelor barber newly come to town would prefer to be seen with a bloody lip and his clothes all covered with wood ashes and dead leaves. <laughs> but he goes back to town. But they had a great party at the grandstand until Cecilia showed up. Yeah. We're, we can just keep talking about this book forever. It's real good. It'll break your heart. I don't know that we need to spoil it. No. Every now and then, people would come to the barbershop and just play music. They'd wander in with these instruments. Just by accident. They just happened to have them. Right. It's not an official gig, you know. No. No plan, supposedly. Well, I got my banjo here. And then by and by, they'd just start playing these songs. And he listed the names of these. Last Gold Dollar, Billy in the Low Ground, Gate to Go Through, and another one called Sand Riffle. Well, I looked these all up. And I was able to find like Smithsonian Folkways recordings of uh, or and such of all of them, but Sand Riffle and uh, you know it's old time. It's pre bluegrass stuff. He said that gener- at that time he hadn't been in Port William very long, and this is about you're talking about generational memory. He says the generation that was old and dying when I settled in Port William had memories that went back to the Civil War, and now my own generation that calls back to the First World War is old and dying, and gray hair is growing on heads that had just looked over tabletops at the time of World War II. I can see how we grow up like crops of wheat and are harvested and carried away. But as the year warmed in 1937, I was a young man. I hardly knew what I knew, let alone what I was going to learn. Yeah, it's wonderful writing. Yeah, I, I like how he describes how everybody figures he's going to be a bachelor. Someone 23, nobody ever told me pointedly or even casually that any eligible maiden was a good cook. Right. <laughs> well, you know, Gladys, she's a good cook. That would be how you set him up, with yeah. Gladys. Now. If Gladys was good looking, you'd say, boy, look at that Gladys. She's lovely. But (laughs) this Gladys is a good cook. Yeah. Uh, Page 140 here, Carl. This little line here right at the top of this paragraph here at the top of the page made me red hot mad, but he's dead on about it. He says, the names of the mighty are known in Port William. The news of their influence is variously brought. In modern times, much of the doing of the mighty has been the undoing of Port William and its kind. Sometimes Port William is persuaded to approve and support its own undoing, but it knows always that a decision unfeelingly made in the capitals can be here felt a blow, a wound received. So he capitalizes the news, yeah. the economy, the war. You know, they're things that do their own actions. They're entities. And I, I thought about that. I've been thinking about it since I read the book. Because we're all very oppressed these days. Oppressed is the wrong word. The news does nasty things to us. Nowadays might be the socials. You know, Mm -hmm. if you pay attention to the news, you're probably depressed to some degree. It's been a, a very interesting and hard... It's not hard like the Depression hard, but 2020 has been, dear listener, if you're from the future, I hope it all worked out. But 2020 has been kind of rough. I tell you what, if we get nine more years of this, it'll be worse than the Great Depression, I think. Yeah, I, well, I hope I hope it doesn't, but hope hope's not going to change anything. If you are a news hound, you're going to be worse off. You can't do anything about it. It oppresses you. You know the names of the leaders of the Senate and the House and and the President. What difference does it make? All it does is bother you. They don't know your name. They don't know your name. 
you know theirs. They're going to make decisions that are going to do things to you. So there's Maddie's husband. We haven't talked about Maddie yet. What's her? What's Troy? Is that his name? <sighs> yeah, Troy. Troy Chatham, I think. He's not a great guy, but he does a lot of things that the economy wants him to do. And when I said economy, it had capital letters on it. Yeah. The economy. And I was thinking about that a lot this past week. There are things that are good for the economy, the economy personified as, well, whatever it is. But what is it? it An oikos in Greek is your household. Right. So economy is the is the management of the household. Ought to be. Well, that's its original meaning. And we yeah. go very, very far from that when we talk about a national economy. We have to do things that are good for the national economy. We have to do things that are good for the stock market. I've got some money in the stock market, not very much. And I suppose it's good for me if it goes up because I can sell it and make money. Bunch of ifs there. Bunch of ifs. But to do national policy based on making the stock market go up seems a little attenuated. Not very close to the household management, which is what economy is, if it's anything. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine Jaber Crow and Burley Coulter and... Athy Keith. Yeah, all these people attempting to live their lives in a town that is destroyed by the progress of the economy. And these are people, uh, by, their, by their own lights and ways, are impervious to it. If you lay in your own canning and you farm with a mule team and you don't buy nitrogen fertilizer and you're a steward of your property and you fish in the river for some of the protein and you butcher hogs and you gather eggs, who cares? Jaber is very, very, very thrifty. He has a garden. He has no running water in his in his place. It's heated by a, a old coal stove, no air conditioning, of course. Uh, he does have electricity, but he's very careful to make sure that his expenses, not to increase his income, but to make sure that his expenses are always something that he can meet in plenty. And that's the way all of the friendly characters in this book behave. There are four, as best as I can tell, there are four modern characters in this book. Troy, Chatham, his two sons, and Cecilia Overholt. Yeah. Troy is a POS. On page 134, Jaber says, it's a serious fault in a man to dislike a boy, but I have to confess that I never liked Troy. Even before he began keeping company with Maddie Keith, I disliked him, you might say, in his own right. He was the kind of boy who always assumes that people are watching him with admiration. He had reason for assuming so, but that in itself may be unwilling to give him the credit he expected. He was a show-off with the other boys. He was a braggart and a bully. He was not making up for any felt inferiority either. Jaber's a little petty until that line. He was not making up for any felt inferiority either. His faults, if he knew them, never laid heavy on his mind. He's the, the young athlete mm -hmm. who never had to think that he wasn't all that he thought he was. Mm -hmm. And he marries the girl, Maddie, Maddie Keith. And Maddie, this is spoilers ahead. Guys, go read this dang book. Pause it. If you haven't read it, go read it. Okay. Jaber does get married, but she doesn't know it. He had seen her when she was 13 or 14 years old, and Jaber was probably around 17, and he knew he knew then that she was special and uh, represented a great number of ideals and perfections to him. By the time she's late in high school, she's dating Troy, who was the star basketball player. And Athy Keith, I think, is Wendell Berry's ideal rule man. Yeoman Farmer. Mm -hmm. Athy is Maddie's dad. And Athy and, Athy and uh, is it Della, the wife, are just grand people. I would love to have known them more than I got to know them from this book. And he says, Troy Cathams, I don't know how they pronounce that. Well, I'll stay with that. Excellence as a player did not matter to Athy Keith. They were not the point. I knew that he had subtracted Troy's talent as a basketball player and had not found enough left over. 
I knew too that Della agreed with him. They didn't tell me this. Nobody did. You don't need to be told some things. So they didn't like the boy. This is a bit of chivalry in this book. Nightly love. You know, Jaber, he's married to her she doesn't know. And she's married to somebody else. He just considers himself married to her. Should we tell the marriage story? Might as well spoil it. Sure. He bought a 39 Dodge, and he would drive over to the next town and go to the roadhouse and dance. This would have been by around 1950, something like that. And they'd listen to probably Hank Williams on the jukebox and dance. And he was seeing a, a woman over in the ne- next town over. I just forgot her name. He was in this this juke joint. Was it Cordy? No, it's not Cordy. That's Aunt Cor- Cordy and... I can't remember. Well, I'll I'm find sorry. it here. But he's in, a, he's in there with her, and Troy comes in, and he's dancing with another woman, and he winks at Jaber, acknowledging that Jaber sees what's going on, and frankly, he just doesn't care. Well, it's also, you're just like me. Right. So Troy is like, there you go, Jaber. You and I, we're the same. Here we are with our lady friends. Right. Chaper goes to the bathroom and crawls out the window because he's done. He's done with it all. Troy's treatment of Maddie breaks him, and he can't even go back and face his date, who he had been seeing for quite some time and, and cared a great deal about. And he crawls out the window. He gives her his car. He went to the car, left her a note, and said, you know, thanks for everything. Here's the car. Take it. Left her the keys, and he walked back home to Port William. And on his walk home, he says, you know, how can she love him? Does he love her? How can she be faithful in this? How could someone not be faithful to her? He just asks all these questions about the nature of love and faith and fidelity. And he decides at that time, right there, on the way home, that she would never know, but he would be faithful to her forever. To show it could be done. Yeah. It's a love that doesn't have an apparent reward, which might be the point. (laughs) Scott's having trouble, dear listener. This book's hitting him right between the eyes. But a love that that looks for a reward, it's it's not the highest kind of love. It might be a kind of love. You scratch my back, I scratch yours, but it's not... I'll do whatever I can for you, and you don't have to do anything for me. You know, the kind that, that Sam Hanks, back in the beginning, I never gave you $5. You know, that kind of love, which is an ideal held out in this book. It's real good. Oh, every single line in it means something, I think, despite what he says at the beginning of it. In 1949, Maddie gave birth to their second child, named as if and perhaps intentionally for nobody. James William, called Jimmy. The first boy was named after her dad. Yeah. The marriage is dying, but she's in it, and she's in it to stay. Yeah, I don't know that I want to talk too much about all of the, all of Maddie and Troy. Uh, oh. There's a comment on him on 271, which connects back to that college comment. Troy's a climber. He wants to become a big man. He wants to have an office, and... and uh, He keeps trying to expand the farm and he's going into debt to do it. And so he has to keep expanding or he won't be able to pay his creditors. He was a dreamer. He could not imagine himself as he was or where he was. And so he dreamed of himself as he would never be. For a dream, he borrowed money, rented land, bought machines, drove them in big fields to the limit of endurance and beyond. It was a dream he could not have escaped even if he had waked up, for he'd belonged to it by his pledge and signature. His name was on too many dotted lines. The too little he earned by too much work already belonged to other people before he ever earned it. A mortgage, if you look that in your, up in your Oxford English Dictionary, it means dead pledge. Mm-hmm. Mortgage. Yeah, it's not good. Now, Athie Keith had 500 acres of the best farmland and the most well-organized and best executed farm in the whole region and was very principled in his way of farming. Uh, There are sayings in here from Athie that I think are wonderful. I mean, I've just almost memorized them. He said, I mean for all the grain and hay in my farm to leave on the hoof. 
So he would he would grow his grain and he'd grow his hay uh, for fodder for his animals, and he sold them as protein on the hoof. And he he kept he kept all the organic matter there as manure, right? Mm-hmm. You got five hundred acres, let's say, and you sell so many steers off of the place every year. Let's say you got five hundred acres. Maybe you can you know you got some of it the house is on. You got a barn and you got some waste that you can't graze. Uh, maybe you can sell a hundred head off of it, let's say, and they weigh 1200 pounds a piece. Well, that's a uh, 120,000 pounds of nutrients that leave that farm. And, you know, cattle farmers are really, uh, grass farmers mostly mm-hmm. with that 120,000 pounds of nutrients that leave that place have got to be replaced. Somehow they've got to be replaced and you can do that. Um, and that's not that big of a deficit to come to come up with with the 500 acres because the plants can draw nutrients out of the air. Uh, they can decompose rock and bring more nutrients up from lower you know substratum in the soil and bring it up for use for the plant and then ultimately get it into the hog or the sheep or the chicken or the cow. Uh, but if you send your hay and your grain away, you've got to buy nitrogen. You've got to buy phosphorus. You have to amend the soil perpetually. Mm-hmm. And you're selling your farm when you sell the vegetable product. That's what Athy Keith is saying. I mean, he's everything that he says has huge significance, I think. You know, Barry, like I said at the beginning of the show, at age 41, bought 125 acres and started farming, in as best as I can tell, Athy Keith's way. I think Athy Keith is who Wendell Berry wants to be. So if you go to his Infogalactic page and you read about Wendell Berry, you'll see that he's kind of a, he's in a, environmental activist and sort of an, an ecologist, mm-hmm. but he's not, the, he's not like the Greenpeace kind, right? There's a kind of a um, conservationist that sees the human as a parasite on the earth and the source of the problems. And I think that Barry sees the human as the steward of the earth and the source of good or can be. I think Athy is that person. He's the Howard Rourke of this book. He, <laughs> That's Troy is the, is the Tui. You know, these people aren't going to know who we're talking about. Fine. <laughs> uh, it's an Ayn Rand novel. I do the show for me and you. Yeah. Well, you whatever. know, that's, that's all we're ever doing. We just, look, Scott and I just talk. Hopefully people like it. Like we just would normally, but we wrote, we roll tape. Yeah. And so, we said on the porch, it sounds a lot like this. It's pretty boring <laughs> for everybody. To ask. So I live in, I live in lawn country. Mm-hmm. And it bugs me. I have a lawn. It's out there mocking me right now because I, I pay money to make it grow. And then I spend money to cut it down and, and time and labor because I'm the one that does it because nobody else can do it in this family yet. I had my boy do it once and the, the lawnmower caught on fire. <laughs> so uh, he's off for a while. But everybody has to fertilize the lawn. Why do you have to fertilize the lawn? Because grass doesn't grow here. Grass might grow in Kentucky. It might grow in England. Okay? Illinois is a little drier. It's a little bit drier. It's not arid. It's sort of thinking about becoming a little drier. And you go the further west you go. If you drive across country, which I recommend, uh, just to see how big it is, and you'll see the the I love to look, look out the boring rides where you're going through farmland. That's not boring to me. I like to see how the mm-hmm. farms change as you go further west, and the crops change. Well, we're just sort of starting to change. Where growing lawn grass no longer makes any sense, yeah. and yet we do it. And town ordinances say you have to do it, and so we have a whole economy of turf builder to make the thing grow out of its normal place. Yep. It would be much more sensible to let the thing go native, plant the plants that were here, and learn to see the beauty in what's natural rather than attempt to impose. That's his thing with religion. He says uh, the religion that he experienced was that order came from the institution, order comes from the soul, comes from the top down, and that the natural is somehow bad. And he's got the opposite idea, which is that nature itself is beautiful. And that includes people. Oh, 
here on page 161, he talks about that church that he's working for right to this point, Carl. In Port William, more than any place else I had been, this religion that scorned the beauty and goodness of this world was a puzzle to me. To begin with, I don't think anybody believed it. I still don't think so. Those world-condemning sermons were preached to people who on Sunday mornings would wear their prettiest clothes. Even the old widows in their dark dresses would be pleasing to look at. By dressing up on the one day when most of them had the leisure to do it, they signified their wish to present themselves to one another and to heaven looking their best. The people who heard those sermons loved good crops, good gardens, good livestock, and work animals and dogs. They loved flowers and the shade of trees and laughter and music. Some of them could make you a fair speech on the pleasures of a good drink of water or a patch of wild raspberries. While the wickedness of the flesh was preached from the pulpit, the young husbands and wives and the courting couple sat thigh to thigh, full of yearning and joy. And the old people thought of the beauty of the children. And when church was over, they would go home to heavenly dinners of fried chicken, it might be, and creamed new potatoes and creamed new peas and hot biscuits and butter and cherry pie and sweet milk and buttermilk. And the preacher and his family would always be invited to eat with somebody. And they would always go. And the preacher, having just forsworn on behalf of everybody the joys of the flesh, would eat with unconsecrated relish. I declare, Miss Pauline, said Brother Preston, who was having Sunday dinner with the Gibbses, those certainly are good briskets. I can't remember how many I've eaten. Preacher, said Uncle Stanley, that makes eight. <laughs> that is a wonderful screed. <laughs> the book is an homage to the goodness of life. I like on 213, this is this is less heavy. The money that Athy had learned in his life had come hard, and he resented the advertiser's implicit assumption that they might fool him into giving it up. Yep. Which goes back to the thought about the economy, capitalized economy. Commerce, continual consumer spending, is good for the economy. Sure, it helps the GNP go up. What good does that do you? The real economy is the one in your house. What what do you care about the net, you know, imports and exports or something? You know, what difference does it make? You should not have. But uh, I, I really like that. I, I think I'm going to try to live like that when I see these advertisements. And if you go on the socials, darn it, our version of the news, all the advertisements are tailored to all your personal information. So they know what you're thinking about buying before you even think about buying it. Well, maybe you ought to resent their implicit assumption that you will be fool enough to give them your money and be a little mad at them or get a VPN and shut off the tracking or, or, <laughs> or don't even go. How about you turn it off except for online great books and go read or spend time with your family or talk to a human being. Or cook a really nice Sunday dinner. You know, if you think about the value that you get out of life, if you read this book, you're going to be kind of sad. You're going to think, I wish I had something like this. Okay, yeah. go. Do it. Got to do it. Got to build it. They done destroyed it, so we got to build it. You're probably going to have to talk to people. Not comment on their Facebook posts. But go talk to human beings. And actually build a common life and friendship. I love, I love Athy, Keith. Uh, I could just read this whole book aloud to everybody. We can't do that though. I'm sure somebody's done the audio book. Yeah, I bought it and sent it to my dad. He's too blind to read it. <laughs> so I sent him the audio book because I, I, I wanted him and my uncle Roy, I talked about earlier. I sent, I sent him one too. Athy passes away. Aunt Della passes away. And there in a page or a page 273, the chapter is a period of disintegration. The first line is, Athie Keith died in the spring of 1961. The war and the economy were seeming more and more to be independent operators. So I think the death of Athie Keith is the death of that old way. And uh, Troy is a modern farmer. He represents the future. Yeah. For good, bad, or indifferent. I want to read what the economy does. So Wendell's got, apparently ha has some opinions. Jaber has some <laughs> opinions. And you can take them or leave them, but you ought to think about them. So uh, this is on bottom of 275. Yeah. 
The household poultry flocks began to dwindle away, so did the little household dairying enterprises of two to maybe half a dozen cows. The farm wives, who had once come to town with produce, bought their groceries, and gone home with money, now went to the store, maybe in some more distant town, with only money, and went home with only groceries. The economy no longer wanted the people of Port William to produce, for instance, eggs. It wanted them to eat eggs without producing them. Or more properly speaking, it wanted them to buy eggs. It didn't care whether the eggs were eaten or not so long as they were bought. It didn't care how fresh they were or how good they were so long as they were bought. People, perhaps, so long as they were paid for, the economy was not much interested even in delivering the eggs. For the economy was studying the purpose of the war, which was to purchase and not have. You stopped the line too early. The customers of the war, all of us, that is, purchase life at a great cost and yet lose it. Well, then you stopped the sentence early. And the <laughs> war was just as busily studying the purpose of the economy, which is to cause people to purchase what they do not need or do not want and to receive patiently what they did not expect. It, like I say, we could read the whole thing, but there's some thought-provoking stuff there. What are the point of the grand movements of the world if they're not to help you and your family? They don't even know about you and your family. Nope. Yeah, it was interesting to uh, to read that little bit about the farm wives and bringing in their produce and leaving with groceries and money from town. He talks earlier about uh, an older widow lady that lives in town, and he would go over and help her move something that was too heavy to move or whatever, and she'd thank him. And she was the last one that practiced the trade of household goods. And I thought, huh. And you read on a couple of lines later and they'd take little decorative knickknacks and stuff around their house, the ladies of the town that they got tired of looking of at looking at and rather than give them to the goodwill or throwing them away, they'd just swap. Hmm. It's a lovely idea here at the end of that chapter on page 282, the interstate dwarfed it in scale, Port William and made light of its needs fuel, money, and people gathered to the interstate as water, waters gathered to the river. The time would come when Mr. Milo Settle would be on the phone to the Standard Oil Company. This is Milo Settle here at Port William, he would say, as if he were calling no farther than Hargrave. Milo, he would say, M-I-L-O. The problem was that the company would no longer deliver as much gas as he needed for his customers. They were squeezing him out, of, out in favor of the service stations on the interstate. I've been selling your products for 50 years, he would say, justice and indignation shaking in his voice to some powerless secretary or receptionist in some place that he knew no more about than she knew about Port William. He might as well have been talking to the chairman of the board. 50 years, he would say, unable to believe that so many years could mean nothing. He needed to buy less than their minimum. And couldn't get it. Couldn't get it. Pay cash money, too. Well, he just needs to get with the times, right? Yep. Needs to have progress. I, I find this is an anti-progress book. The difficulty with the concept of progress is that it's undefined. It's just continued movement, but movement to where? You know, if you consider in, in the human body, we have growth that is ordered and has a purpose, and that's the natural renewal of your body. And if you have growth that has no purpose, it's cancer. But it's growing, it's thriving, you know, but for what purpose? We must progress, but progress to what? Nobody ever wants to answer that question. And it's just a dumb idea. You know, we all know about the infinite regress problem. Oh, it's turtles all the way down. We know about that. Well, it's turtles all the way up too, if you're just looking for progress. There has to be an end. There has to be an ultimate goal. Going to have to read a little uh, Wendellian sermonizing here, Carl, on page 287. It was Saturday, and they were at the barber shop, and Troy, old Troy, says <laughs> they ought to round up. This is about 1968 or 69 or something like that. This is a deep Vietnam era right here. It says, Troy says, they ought to round up every one of them sons of bitches and put them right in front of the God, the damned communist, and then whoever killed who, it'd be all to the good. I don't even know what he's talking about. There was a little pause after that. War protesters. Oh, yeah, protesters. Nobody wanted to try to top it. I thought of Athy's reply to Hiram Hinch. Now, earlier in the book, Hiram, uh, Athy, with just a few quiet words, disarms and humiliates and ruins, intellectually at least, uh, a racist that was in the barbershop. 
So he thinks about Athi and his dignity and intellect. And Jaber says, it was hard to do, but I quit cutting hair and looked at Troy. I said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. Troy jerked his head up and widened his eyes at me. Where did you get that crap? I said, Jesus Christ. And Troy said, oh. It would have been a great moment <laughs> in the history of Christianity, except that I did not love Troy. <laughs> That's both funny and very good. Yeah. He doesn't love Troy. Well, let's make a point here. So he's got his puzzle of loving Troy, which he has to do as well as he possibly can, even though it's real hard. If you take that little bit of Christianity that you're supposed to love not your neighbor, although them too, but your enemies, your enemies are in your house. They're in your neighborhood. They're the people all around you, and they're the ones you have to love. It's very easy. Well, gosh, my, my wife listens to this. Uh, it's very easy to love people that you never met. But it's not really love because you can't actually do anything. There's no common life. There's no encounter there. To love the people that you meet, well, one, it requires you to meet people, but it's harder. It's very easy to be extremely hateful in the anonymity of social media because you don't really know any of those people. And if you're going to love people that, that are in some country far, far away from you, that doesn't make any difference either. You better love the people that you see in the barbershop. If you're going to take this lesson, you know, this, this, what Troy calls that bit of crap. If, if you're going to take that seriously, you have to do it with real people. Right. That snore when they, when they're awake or gosh, my brother, he'll never listen to this, but my brother, the thing that I'm sending it to him, I don't know that I've forgiven him. What he does is when he eats cereal when he eats, can you imagine this? When he eats cereal, he takes the spoon into his mouth fine. But when he's pulling the spoon out of the mouth, it grates on his top teeth. Every morning, for as long as we lived in the same house, he's, <laughs> I hated that. But that's the sort of thing you have to deal with if you're going to take that seriously. It's not loving some abstract person on another continent. It's, I have to deal with my brother. He hates Troy. And he has to deal with him. And sometimes he's got a straight razor in his hand. Mm -hmm. And he loves Maddie. And not in a uh, pop sense. He really loves and honors her. Troy does not in that way. And it's hard for him to not cut his throat. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> well, that's an act of love then, isn't it? Well, and is it for Troy or for her? For both, I guess. A non-act of love. A non-act of hate. I'm going to throw this out for our, our buddy John Pascarella on the bottom of 295. Uh, yeah. So there's a bit in uh, Brothers Karamazov, which <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to read it. It's too long. Um, but it's really good. Where there's this old monk that talks about how everybody's responsible for everyone else's sins. Which is a real hard thing to read until you think about it. You know, every bit of, of meanness that you do, it's going to be part of somebody else's personality. And then when it comes back to you, well, it's your fault. But it's also his fault, but it's also everyone else's fault. So uh, the way Barry has it written here, I would sometimes be horrified in every moment I was alone. I could see no escape. We are too tightly tangled together to be able to separate ourselves from one another, either by good or by evil. We are all involved in all and every good and in all and any evil, for any sin we all suffer. That is why our suffering is endless. It is why God grieves and Christ's wounds are still bleeding. That's some pretty deep stuff there. I even want to go a little further. So you have that situation where it's just sadness on top of sadness. But the mercy of the world is time. Time does not stop for love, but it does not stop for death and grief either. After death and grief, that it seems ought to have stopped the world, the world goes on. More things happen, and some of the things that happen are good. My life was changing now. It had to change. I'm not going to say that it changed for the better. There was good in it as it was, but also there was good in it as it was going to be. Yeah. That's some good stuff right there, or <sighs> some thought-provoking stuff. 
just before then, because his life's changing, an inspector from town <laughs> comes the in. The barber inspector. And to inspect the barber shop, which had been there since the early 1900s. Uh, Burley had been cutting hair there for over 30 years, and the bar- barber horse field had been there for many, many years prior to that. The people of the town saw fit to go get their hair cut there and trusted him with it and uh, gave him their custom, and it all was fine until this guy walked in and says, hey, there's no running water here. <laughs> Jaber wasn't just getting rich off the thing in the beginning. To begin with, he couldn't afford to actually put water in there with no more of the business than he had. He had a sign that says, uh, be back, uh, I'll be back. You know, one of these paper, these cardboard signs that have the little hands on them. It looks like a clock and you move the hands around and it'll say back at, and then you can move the hands around to three fifteen or whatever. It was the Barber horse fields and the hands wouldn't stay. They just hung down at six 30. <laughs> so if he left at five, he had to be back at six 30 but if he left at 6.45, he didn't have to be back till the morning. But nobody came to get a haircut at 6.30 in the morning, so it, he really didn't have to be back till 6.30 the next night. But <laughs> when, he, when he quit the barbershop, because of the inspector, he still had that same sign. He did a good job for his people as he needed to, and he didn't do anything more than, than he needed to do, which wasn't because he was lazy. It was because he's efficient. He was thrifty. And he was careful, and he was proud, too. And that inspector essentially put him out of business. Yeah, so there's somebody at some meeting in the Kentucky capital. I've been there. We used to travel in the days you could travel. And we'd go into state capitals and see the big halls of democracy all over the place. They're kind of neat to go into. But somebody in one of those buildings says, barbershops ought to have running water. Yeah, here, here, I think that's right. Stroke of a pen, you know, take a vote, down comes the gavel. Now somebody's livelihood in Port William is gone. And it's not just that. Port William loses a barber forever. There's not enough business there to pay a monthly minimum water bill, plus a water heater and the plumbing and the inspection for the plumbing. And Now they can't even have a barber. Well, it was a good idea. Everyone would say it's a good idea. Yeah, barbershops mm-hmm. should have water, but you make the decision far, far away, and it has ripples you don't even think about. So Jaber says to Burley, his best lifelong friend, he says, uh, I thought I'd buy me a little patch down by the river with trees and maybe a garden spot. I'd build me a little house out of secondhand lumber. It's the Rose Cabin. I'd end my public life and commence private one. I'd build a little boat. There it was. That's what I was wanted to do. I could see my boat, my green boat, floating light as a leaf by the shady bank at the end of a path coming down from the house. Burley was grinning. He saw. He knew. But he said, you don't have to build no house. I got a house I'm not using. Lord, I don't expect I've stayed two nights in it since Ma'am died. He was talking about his little camp house where we'd come ashore out of the flood that morning in 1937. I had seen it many times since then, but I knew the look of it. I saw that he saw. And you'd be willing to part with it? No. No need for me to part with it. I'll just give you the use of it. Yep. And he goes, lives in in the little house. And the book, well, I don't know that I want to tell you the ending. I think you yeah. ought to read it. Uh, we, we've left out most of the main plot point, really. Did we? Yeah. We've mentioned the marriage, but we haven't really. You need to go read it. You need to read about Troy. You need to read about Maddie. You need to read about the marriage. You need to listen to it. Watch it all play out. Yeah, thumbs up for me. It's really good. If you like it, apparently there's a whole bunch of novels set in the same area, and you can dig in. And if you like it, you might think, why do I like it so much? And if it feels like home to you that you've never been to, maybe you could make some of that home where you live. Yeah, I know these people. And I share so many of these sentiments, his style of writing, the cadence, the vocabulary, all of it's just, just what I needed. He says, uh, and I, I think this is me. Danny Branch was Burley Coulter's son by Kate Helen Branch. They never got married. Burley was a little bit of a free spirit. <laughs> 
As much as any of the old timers, he regarded the depression as not over and done with, but merely absent for a while, like Haley's comment. And I'm like that. I think this shit that we've had from 41 to, I don't know, 2001 has been an unusual distraction. I was talking to a friend of mine this morning, and uh, we, he was talking about paying off his mortgage. You know, and a lot of people say, well, your interest rate's 3% and it's tax deductible, so you're actually paying something like two points. And historically, the stock market pays about 7.5%, and you can keep the spread. So don't pay your house off and let the money ride in those stocks, because historically, you will net out about five points per annum. And I just don't buy that, because I read all these old books, and they say historically, and they mean like mm, 111 years. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking 3,000 years. I'm thinking 500 years. You know, the Great Depression was just a reminder of what it what used to be like, where if it didn't rain enough, the youngest kid died. That's what it used to be like. I don't yearn for that, but it's always right behind me, you know? Mm-hmm. I think there's a hard economic times, and here I am in Oklahoma. Hopefully I can do this and not get too terribly political. You know, we had the Dust Bowl here, and these Okies Okies fled and went to California or or other places for economic opportunity, and I understand that. And I was talking to somebody who's uh, had some cousins that are coming back to Oklahoma, and they were cousins whose people had left Oklahoma in the 30s and gone to California, now they're coming back. And I said, you know, they're not like us, because our people stayed, and they ran, and they're running again. They're the running kind. It's not the same thing. And I hope well for them, but they're not the same kind, you know? And uh, this book is about the people that stayed in Port William Mm -hmm. for good and for bad. So, uh... (laughs) (laughs) Tore me up. No, you go read it. Go read it and see if it does to you what it's done to to Scott. It (laughs) does to me a bit. I don't think it hits me as hard because I'm on the the border of Yankeedom. Uh, we're awfully far from our farms and my family. It's been, it's been a hundred years, uh, but you should go read it. What are we going to do next? Oh gosh. Are we going to get our other stuff in and not quick enough? Uh, we're hoping to do some Tolkien for you. It depends if the book comes in soon enough. If it doesn't come in soon enough, we can grab something else and do it, but stay tuned. We're going to try to do, uh, Leaf by Niggle and the essay on fairy stories, which is generally attached to it and see what, uh, uncle J R R has to say about that. Cause everybody's your uncle, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Right. There's some good thoughts in there about art and why you do it and what you're trying to represent. It's been 25 years since I read that story and it had an effect on me when I read it. So yeah, that'll be like the first time again. How long uh, between readings is it make it new again? Well, it's never quite new because I, I forget it. I mean, I mean, I don't forget it. I remember some distinct things from the story. I'd have to completely forget it for it to be totally new. Right. Uh, but we'll get to that. I love this book so much, and I hope everybody else does too, but they won't. No, I think a lot of them will. I think a lot of them will, but not all of them will. I don't know about, I don't know how me and me and was this going to be the test for friendship? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) If you don't like this book, you can't be his friend. Yeah. Thanks to McKay though, for sending it to me after he gave me this book. I, I, he kept Wendell Berry kept bumping into my life and people kept saying, have you, you reading Wendell Berry? So, uh, I guess I was called to read Wendell Berry. Like Jaber was called to cut the hair of Port William for, 30 plus years. Goodness gracious. That just wore me out. Mm-hmm. We're getting ready to open up some more of our little free sessions. We did some back when everybody was supposedly going to die of uh, uh, whatever that was. And we're all going to make it now. We know that. But so we're not going to call them the plague sessions anymore. We're going to call them the gateway sessions. So you can go to onlinegreatbooks.com and you can go sign up for those things. You can go to uh, I'll, I'll fix it, Carl, so they can go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash 
podcast and sign up for those. We're going to do a whole bunch of different books this time. We don't have the science fiction and the comedy like we did last time. We're going to have a little uh, a little Kipling, right? We're going to do uh, a whole variety of things. You'll see the titles there, so you can go to a free seminar with us. Carl is going to lead one. Pascarell is going to lead some. Malachi is going to lead some. Marsha Enright is going to do The Compra Chicos by Ayn Rand. It'll be great fun. Mm-hmm. And if you got any questions or comments or whatever, you can send those to podcast at onlinegreatbooks.com. And sometime when I'm sitting on the toilet, I will read those. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Carl? No. <laughs> uh, I kept myself together better than I thought I would. The last half of the book, I just was in a state of dehydration for just crying. I was just sitting on the back porch, just leaking on this book for like a day. Ugh. Yeah, it's good. You'll like it. If you buy it and you don't like it, I'd be surprised. I'm a Wendell Berry fan. Uh, I'm going to have to go find his place and just walk up the driveway and bang on his door before he kicks a bucket. He's 85, 86 years old. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please recommend this to somebody. Get the audio book and send it to your dad. Right? That's what I did. You should do that. And we will talk to you next week about uh, Tolkien's uh, essay on what? Mythopoiesis? Yeah, and uh, storytelling. Leaf by Niggle. It's weird. Thanks. Thanks.